So Jana Kent from Co-Diagnostics is going to talk to us about a novel multiplex PCR-based solution for SNP genotyping. So thank, thank you. you, Jana. Good afternoon. I would like to introduce in my presentation a uh, um, novel primer system, which is called Cooperative Primers, and uh, talk about its application uh, for SNP genotyping that's PCR-based. Um, Before I start, I would like to talk a little bit about the role of PCR in agrigenomics. Um, we all probably know that uh, PCR is a very powerful tool that's uh, enabling us to collect large amount of genetic information uh, from progeny, which in turn allows for better selection processes. And uh, SNP markers, as has been iterated many times before, um, are very useful uh, and very uh, gaining popularity. And uh, they are popular because they are abundant uh, throughout the genomes, uh, and they are also uh, compatible with high throughput genotyping processes. Uh, one of which is uh, endpoint uh, PCR SNP genotyping, which is uh, popular especially for high sample number workflows uh, that are being tested for a smaller collection uh, of SNPs. Uh, the problem, though, is that even though it's fairly economical, uh, it is still expensive enough that uh, it is prohibitive for unrestricted uh, testing. So uh, the tendencies are to uh, decrease further uh, the cost uh, per SNP that is genotyped. And uh, one of the ways how to decrease the cost is to run uh, the genotyping assays uh, in multiplex fashion. And uh, multiplexing allows us to increase the uh, number of samples tested um, without affecting the R&D budget uh, and labor costs. And also, if the multiplex assays are designed to run on existing instruments, uh, one does not need to invest into purchasing uh, additional equipment. Um, however, there are challenges with uh, multiplex PCR. And uh, mostly the greatest challenge is that uh, one cannot multiplex uh, assays uh, in any way that one wants because not all assays play well together. <laughs> Thus, um, the multiplex assays often have to undergo extensive optimization. Um, but our technology, cooperative primers, uh, may overcome uh, this challenge uh, without any difficulties. Now, uh, what are the cooperative primers or co-primers uh, for short? What you see on the slide is uh, the conventional primer, which consists of a short oligonucleotide that's uh, bound uh, to its target sequence and is capable of extending from its uh, three prime end. In contrast, uh, cooperative primers uh, consist of two uh, separate fragments. Uh, one with somewhat higher affinity for the template and one with a little bit lower affinity for the template. And the combined length of those two fragments uh, roughly equals to that of the conventional primer. These two fragments uh, are connected um, by a flexible linker that is chemically blocked on uh, both ends uh, to prevent DNA polymerase from extending through the linker. Now the longer fragment, the one that has somewhat higher affinity for the template, is equipped with uh, both fluorophore and a quencher in a manner that's similar to the Tacman probes. And the shorter fragment now has uh, a free three prime end, so it can function as a primer. Upon extension, um, the longer fragment or the probe uh, gets hydrolyzed by the DNA polymerase and the fluorophore uh, is released. Because the short primer sequence uh, cannot bind without the longer sequence binding first, uh, then each extension results in a fluorophore cleavage. Now the short uh, primer sequence um, has such a low TM or melting temperature that its binding is very specific. And uh, it allows us um, to construct primers that have such high allele specificity that they can detect allelic changes that are as short as a single nucleotide, which in turn allows us to design um, allele-specific co-primer. Um, what I would like to talk about today is how do we use co-primers uh, for generation of SNP genotyping systems that are of perhaps even 
greater differentiation power uh, than, for example, Tachman probes. So each uh, genotyping assay consists of two allele-specific co-primers that are shown on the picture. And I'm explaining the system on a uh, SNP example that denotes change from A to G. So it's an A to G SNP. So the assay consists of uh, two co-primers. One is A allele-specific and the other one is G allele-specific. And then we have also in the assay present um, um, a locus specific primer that in this case is a reverse primer. Both allele specific uh, primers, A and G, are labeled <coughs> with two different fluorophores. Um, the A allele specific co primer is labeled with the green fluorophore, and the G allele specific co primer is labeled with the red fluorophore. Now, in this scenario, um, the A allele specific co primer uh, attempts hybridization to the A allele, and it does hybridize, and um, you see that uh, it is perfectly matched. Um, the G allele specific co primer also attempts hybridization uh, to the A allele template. <coughs> However, uh, there is a mismatch uh, at the penultimate base of the priming sequence. Upon extension, the A allele specific co primer extends with no problems because it's perfectly matched and uh, hydrolyzes uh, the probe sequence and releases the green fluorophore, which is indicative of the presence of the A allele. The G allele specific co-primer, which is also bound to the A uh, allele target, um, exhibits mismatch at the penultimate base uh, of the priming sequence. And we suspect that even the ultimate base of the priming sequence uh, is not capable of binding, with the penultimate sequence being not bound. Thus, bound coprimer has really a big difficulty of extending. And if it does extend at all, it extends with a very low efficiency. We have tested our genotyping system based on co-primers on several SNPs uh, selected from LGC's uh, public database. Um, it was a public database for corn, I forgot to mention. Um, we have run the assays on a four-channel thermocycler, which is a magnetic induction cycler from biomolecular systems under standard PCR conditions. We have tested several different master mixes, uh, including the BHQ uh, PHQ probe master mix from LGC and also GT Express master mix uh, from Thermo Fisher. The co primer concentration was for allele specific co primer 0 0.1 micromolar each, and the uh, locus specific co primer was at 0 0.2 micromolar concentration. Each 10 microliter reaction consisted of 3,000 copies of a synthetic template or 10 nanograms um, of the corn genomic DNA extract. At first, we wanted to see um, what are the differentiation powers of co-primers for each possible SNP scenario. So we have six possible DNA changes um, that we wanted to test. So this is a real-time PCR curves uh, for each SNP scenario. In uh, red traces, we see amplification uh, of templates that are homozygous for the first allele. And then in blue traces, which in some cases are most completely flat, uh, is the amplification by the same co-primer uh, of a template that's homozygous for the other allele. Now in green are traces uh, of amplification uh, of a heterozygous template. So the differentiation power is pretty good, um, and we can deduce that from the differential amplification of the red and green, uh, red and blue traces, which are denoting amplifications uh, of the same co-primer for homozygous template for allele one and homozygous template for the allele two. Next, we wanted to see uh, how does the co-primer genotyping system behave in a duplex reaction. So what you see now are not real-time PCR curves, but the scatter plots uh, for two SNPs, uh, in this case SNP M11 
with genotyping results are shown on the right, and SNP M1 with genotyping results are shown on the left. Now, we wanted to also see not only if the coprimers are capable of uh, doing a good job in duplex SNP reactions, but also whether you can mix and match the reactions in any ways you want, and even whether it affects uh, the quality of the results. So on the next slides, we see the same SNP M11, this time duplexed with SNP M3. And the genotyping results for SNP M11 are again shown on the right, and the uh, genotyping results for SNP M3 are shown on the left. And you see that really there is not any significant change in the performance of the SNP M11 when paired with either SNP M1 or M3. On the next slide, uh, <coughs> we see uh, the same SNP M11 on the right, this time paired with the SNP M10. And again, there is really no great difference in the performance of the SNP M11. To perform further testing, this time we concentrated on uh, the assay for SNP M3 and mixed that assay with several different uh, SNP assays. So on this slide, it's again the SNP M3 paired with SNP M11. And M3 paired with SNP M2. And lastly, SNP M3 paired with SNP M4. Next, we wanted to see how does this genotyping assay perform on corn DNA. Uh, and screening of about 60 corn genomic DNAs uh, generated enough material uh, in sufficient genotype combinations uh, to perform uh, duplex testing for SNP M3 and M4 on corn. And those are the results you are looking at right now with the SNP M3 scatter plot shown on the left and scatter plot for uh, SNP M4 shown on the right. It actually does appear that when you go back and look at the synthetic DNA results that the corn performs almost even slightly better. Now again, as has been iterated before, multiplexing <laughs> is a good thing and can save you a lot of money and work. Um, and um, here it is put into some numbers. So we know that uh, has been calculated that um, even duplexing SNP assays uh, can save you almost 40% of the cost um, of your genotyping assays. And one can increase testing without having to increase our in the budget and labor costs. And again, if the testing is performed on existing machines, one can increase the lab capacity without having to purchase additional equipment or hire more people. And thanks to the fact that cooperative primers are good at mixing and matching uh, genotyping assays, one can maintain flexible workflow. So co-primers do enable multiplex PCR for SNP genotyping. And what we have shown you now uh, was <coughs> duplex reactions. And uh, in the original proof of concept, we could show that we can quadruplex. Uh, however, because we only have a four-channel machine, the quadruplexing has been performed with half-labeled and half-unlabeled uh, co-primers, which doesn't make for pretty pictures. Um, and co-primers do um, are compatible with assay interchangeability with minimal optimization, which is in contrast to all the other existing uh, genotyping technologies. Co-primers are available from LGC Biosearch Technologies as BHQplex co-primers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jana. Um, invite questions from the floor. No, it's just a regular PCR. Okay, so what's the what are you trying to achieve at the end? What's the maximum multiplex you would like to accomplish? That depends on the number of channels of your instrument. So let's say if you have an eight channel machine, mm -hmm. you can uh, quadruplex uh, because for each SNP you need two channels, mm -hmm. just like with the Pacman probe. So the limitation will come from the fluorophore, not from the multiplexing. That is correct. Right. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so one, one question I'd like to just come up on Slido, which I think is related to your talk, Jana, is how do co-primer methods differ from RHM? How are they different from RHM? I think that the principle is different, obviously. However, um, I think the difference, the greatest difference is in the advantages of the multiplexing. And I do not know uh, what is the multiplexing limit on the RHM. But uh, I do remember reading uh, recently that uh, even duplexing has been somewhat challenging. Um, that's about all I can say how different that is. Um. And then another question that's come up on slide again related to your talk is, how do you use uh, your technology in high throughput setting um, with the use of LGC instrumentation? Oh, sorry. So it's the top question there in blue. High throughput setting with the use of LGC instrumentation. Well, that probably is a more question for, uh, for LGC than me, but uh, I am not sure whether uh, there are any plans. Uh, uh, um, again, I do know, but then I'm not at liberty to say that. <laughs> really what uh, it boils down to, and perhaps uh, I'm not sure if you know what uh, can be disclosed or not. So I, I can probably answer that question in, in essence that um, obviously typically most platforms are limited to, to five color readers. It is, a, it is a, a, obviously a process to how can, how can you then expand that out. Obviously if you want to get to a, a full plex reaction you're going to need, need a nine channel reader and that's obviously something which uh, is not, not there that today as, as a product. So typically it would be if you're looking at SNP genotyping you're looking at a duplex based reaction if you're doing maybe events of interest, absence, presence testing, then you're, you're at a fourplex reaction at the moment with the, with the current technology in terms of platform. Okay, thank you, Anna.